All right, we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. As we continue in a uh, Best of Scripture series, this is Scripture, 1 Thessalonians. I think uh, this passage uh, and this message that I've titled, Thank God, is going to help us this morning with that very thing. It's going to move us from complaining about others to thanking God for them, from moaning and groaning to praising and thanking. And you're saying this morning, not a chance, preacher. I know God does miracles, but not a chance. But I think that he is going to move our hearts in this good direction. First Thessalonians is written by the Apostle Paul to a church that he planted on his second mission trip. It's in modern-day Greece, and he opens his letter with a greeting and a thanksgiving. He thanks God for five truths about them, and these are five things that are true about us this morning here at Table Rock also. And we can thank God for these things by watching for them in other people the way that Paul watched for them and saw them in the church at Thessalonica. These are five truths that we can put into practice in our own lives so that we're looking more and more like Jesus. So let's go ahead and read through the passage, pray, and we'll go through it verse by verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 out of the English Standard Version. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only is the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, now you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's the word of the Lord for us this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we do say thank you this morning. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for this chance we have to hear from you through the study of your word. We ask, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One day, Jesus entered a village, and as he entered, there was a group of 10 guys off to the side. They were in the, on the outskirts. They were outcasts because they had leprosy, a highly contagious disease that caused rashes to form all over their body. It desensitized them so that they lost their sense of touch. A 10-year-old boy with leprosy once helped a doctor who was trying to get a key to open a door, and the doctor couldn't quite turn it. And the 10-year-old boy came and just turned it no problem. And as the doctor took a closer look, he sliced himself right down to the bone and didn't even realize that he'd done it. Leprosy. They were deadened to their sense of touch. They had been isolated from their family members. They were outcasts. And they cried out to Jesus as he enters into this village with leprosy-ravaged voices. It even affected their ability to speak. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus is merciful, and he is full of compassion. And he just said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. Not something that leprous people would do. They were outcasts. They were unclean. They couldn't go show themselves to the priests. But off they went to show themselves to the priest. And 
as they went, they were healed. As they went, they were cleansed. And one out of these ten, one of them saw that he was healed and he turned back, praising God now with a loud voice that's been healed. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. You can read about this in Luke 17, 11 to 19. He gives thanks to Jesus. Jesus, thank you. I can go see my wife now. Thank you. I can hug my kids now. Thank you, Jesus. I can work with my hands again and provide for my family. Thank you, Jesus. He was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And we learn from this that Jesus actually expects people that he heals, people that he cleanses, people that he rescues to give thanks to God, to praise God for his work in their lives. And so as I think about this, it cuts me to the heart because I realize, wow, I think that I've been much more like the nine in my life than I have been like the one. How many times has God blessed me? How many blessings has he heaped into my life that I forget to thank him for, that I just go about my day? And Paul doesn't make that mistake. He's more like the one. And, and he's, he writes to this church in Thessalonica. He not only gives thanks for the stuff that God's doing in his own life, but he actually thanks God for what God's doing in their lives. And so we can learn from this. Thank God is what we want to do. Notice how he begins with his greeting. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, that's who's writing, to the church of the Thessalonians, modern-day Greece, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, did you know it matters? It's more important who you're in than where you're at. They were at Thessalonica, but they were in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, you might be in at Medford, Oregon, but you and I are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great place. It's, these are great, uh, it's a great God to be in. And he says, grace to you and peace. Grace. It's God's unmerited favor towards those who deserve his wrath and peace. There was hostility. There was enmity. There was strife. And now there is peace between them and God, between us and God. Grace and peace. Now we're going to see the first of the five things that he thanks God for. First, he thanks God for the essentials. The essentials, the main things. Notice, we give thanks to God always for all of you. He constantly thanks God for every one of them. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering. As he thinks about them. He remembers these things about them and he thanks God for them. Remembering before our God and Father, here are the essentials, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, love, and hope, these are essentials in the Christian life. There might be a lot of things that we would disagree about when it comes to end times. There could be a lot of things that we might disagree about in the Christian life, but here in these essentials, we have agreement, faith, love, and hope. They've been called three sisters, the three sisters of faith, charity, and hope. Up in Bend, there, right next to Bend, there's Sisters, Oregon, and Sisters, Oregon is named for the three mountain peaks, those three sisters that once were originally called, named Faith, Hope, and Charity, those three mountains. Picture, if you will, Three, now girls, three sisters in a lodge, in a great room of a lodge, a mountain lodge there overlooking those mountain peaks. The first sister is Faith. And as she sits in this great room, she's looking down at her Bible 
and her face is just shining as she reads her Bible and actually believes what's written in it. She believes that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again. Faith loves God's word and trusts him to do what only he can do. The second sister, Hope, is sitting by the window and she's looking out over those three mountain peaks and she sees the sun rising upon them and she just has so much hope in her heart, a confident expectation of coming good. She just knows that, hey, it could be today that Jesus comes back. I'm going through hard things and yeah, there's all kinds of darkness around me and yet Jesus, our blessed hope, could come back today. It could be today. She's expecting his soon return. And the third sister, Charity, or love, is sitting there on the couch, and she's knitting hats for orphans in the Ukraine. She's heard about orphans who are cold through the winter, and they need hats, and so she's knitting these hats for those orphans and asking God to bless them as she does a labor of love for those orphans. These three sisters of faith, love, and hope. We can thank God for them by watching for them in others. Watching for them in others even when enormous trials are smashing against them. Have you ever talked to somebody who's going through a crushing time and yet they say to, to you, they say to me, but I know that God is good. I don't know why this is happening to me, but I know that God is good and that he is wise, he knows what he's doing, and that he's in control of the situation. The way that he's running my life is different maybe than the way that I'd be running my life, but he knows better than I do, and, and so I'm trusting him. I'm asking him to make this stop, I'm asking him to make this go away, but I know that he's good. There's a a faith that endures it. And there's also a, a steadfastness of hope that despite all evidence to the contrary, we actually do believe that Christ is risen from the dead, that he actually has conquered death, that he is risen, he is ascended, and he is coming back soon. It might get darker and darker around us, bleaker and bleaker, and yet there is this hope that we have because we're not hoping in things that are seen. We're not hoping in the things of this world. We're not hoping in this political system or this governmental system or this welfare system or any of these systems. We're hoping in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are hoping in the one who is ruling over it all. We're hoping in Jesus. And so we have a steadfastness of hope that can persevere through all of this stuff. And we can watch for these things in other people. And we can practice them in our own lives. You and I can do works of faith, labors of love, that we can have a steadfastness of hope as we trust in the Lord. You know, there was a guy named Abraham you want to look for faith, hope, and love in the life of Abraham, uh, he didn't always nail it. He grew up in the home of an idolater. His dad was Terah. They worshiped idols in his house, and God rescued Abraham, called him. Abraham trusted God and began walking with him. But you know how it is when you walk by faith. Sometimes you stumble. Sometimes you falter. And Abraham wasn't perfect. Just ask his wife, Sarah. He exposes Sarah to a whole, like, harem, and just like he... Yeah, he didn't always get it right. And there came a day in particular in Genesis chapter 22 where God tested Abraham. Did you know that God tests people? He tests our faith. And he says to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham hears the word of God and responds in faith and says, here I am. And God says, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, you know that son, Abraham, that I've promised is get, like through him? You're going to have more descendants than, our, than there are stars in the sky or sand on the seashore. Isaac, your son of promise, the one that you'd been waiting for like your whole life until you were like 
90 years old, and here comes Isaac. This son that God's going to bless all the peoples of the earth through, take that son whom you love. It's the first appearance of love in the Bible. It speaks of the love that a father has for his son. Take him and offer him as a burnt offering, this mountain range of Moriah. And so Abraham, in faith, says, here I am, God. And in faith, the, a work of faith, Abraham gets to work and he starts chopping the wood that he's going to set on fire for his son to be a burnt offering on. That's a tough work of faith, but he believes God as his faith is tested and he loves the Lord. And so, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He actually obeys God. He loves his son. There's this labor of love. There's this work of faith. And off they go to the mountain range. And, uh, and Isaac, they travel for three days. For three days, Isaac is as good as dead in his dad's mind. And just as they get to the mountain where they're supposed to go and sacrifice, Abraham says to his servants, hey guys, you stay here. Me and the lad, Isaac, we're going to go on top of this mountain and we're going to worship God and then we're going to come back to you. Now, this is an amazing thing. Here's faith of Abraham. How could this even be possible? How could he go and worship God and sacrifice his son and then say, me and the lad, we're going to come back? He counted, according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 17, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. This is the only way the promises can be fulfilled. I'm going to sacrifice my son, and God, like, you're going to have to raise him from the dead. So me and the lad, we're going, to go, we're going to go worship, and then we're going to come back. And all of this was a type of Jesus Christ, the, uh, the greater son, and the greater father, who would sacrifice his son there on that same mountain. And so there was a hope in Abraham that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. In faith, he trusted God's word, and we can too. In faith, in love, Abraham obeyed God with his beloved son, and we can obey God with our kids and our grandkids too. In hope, he looked forward to resurrection, and we can too. So those are the essentials that we thank God for, faith, love, and hope. And we also thank God for election. Check out verses 4 and 5. We thank God for election. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. He says, we know this, brothers. He reminds them that they're in God's family. They are brothers. He reminds them that they are loved by God. And remember, hey, we are in God's forever family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that they were loved by God, and you and I are loved by God. We are his beloved. The best thing about today, very simple, is that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so, and right here the Bible tells you that you are loved by God. So we know that you're brothers, that you're loved by God, and that he has chosen you. He picked you. He elected you. It's not like the election that we have in this country every four years where we vote for the person who we think will do the best job of running the country. God's election is not like that. He doesn't choose you and me because he thinks we're going to do a great job of running the country. No. It's not like that. Listen to this, Wayne Grudem's definition of it. He says that it's an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. So it's not like picking a president, and uh, it's not like picking a puppy. Have you ever gone to pick out a puppy? I did a couple of Christmases ago. I was feeling really outnumbered. I had four 
uh, a wife and three girls in my household, no other guys. I thought it's time to get a puppy and it's going to be a guy. I need another guy in this house. And I've got three daughters and I want this to be kind of a guard dog, like a shepherd. So I'm going to name this puppy Shep. He's going to watch over him, so I don't want a wimpy puppy. This thing's got to be tough, he's got to be big, and he's got to be handsome. So I go, and I did get to pick out a yellow lab. There was a brown lab and a yellow lab. I'm looking, I have to pick between these two. The brown lab is a girl, and he's a guy, so I'm already voting for this one. But he's strong, the pick of the litter. The breeder says, he's going to be a big dog. I said, that's just the dog I'm looking for, OK? So, and I picked Shep, and he wound up being a little bit more uh, everything that we needed. But he was fun for a couple of years, that's for sure. So anyway, it's not like picking a puppy. Sometimes you pick the, wrong pu the right puppy. Sometimes you pick the wrong one, you know. Shep was amazing. But he's still alive. We didn't put him down or anything. <laughs> we did have to rehome him. We had short, anyway, it's another story. But. <laughs> The election of God is not like picking a puppy. He doesn't pick you because you're the best looking or the strongest or anything like that. He doesn't pick you because of you. He picks you because of him. You see, we're more like those lepers out on the outskirts that nobody would pick. We're the ones that nobody wants to be around. And God says, I pick you. You are my chosen. I set my affection upon you. Hear how personal it is. These aren't like lottery balls that get picked all randomly. No, he has chosen you to be in his forever family. And we're not going to answer every question we could possibly have about election, but we do know that we can thank God for it. And we can thank God for election when we're out witnessing and sharing our faith with other people. I'm really thankful for that. You know, this is a great time to share the gospel with people. Uh, I love when I'm in line at the store asking the checker, say, hey, what do you make of the empty tomb? That is just a great conversation <laughs> starter, okay? <laughs> what do you make of the empty tomb? Because everybody's got to make something of it. That tomb is empty. What do you make of it? And so far, they've still taken my money. They've been kind, the whole deal. <laughs> Pray for the checkers, right? So we can thank God for election when we're witnessing because, hey, God chooses people out there. And Paul knew that these, the Thessalonians were chosen because they responded to the gospel. Look at what he says. God has chosen you, we know, because our gospel came to you not only in word. It's not just in word that's fallen on deaf ears, but it's also coming in power like miracles are at work here in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction that the Holy Spirit opened up your blind eyes, he opened up your deaf ears, he opened up your hard heart, and you received. And there was a full conviction here, conviction of your sin and conviction that God's word is true. So he knows that they're actually God's pick because of how they responded to the gospel. And so when we're out witnessing, we can trust that there are people that God is drawing to himself. And as we share the truth of the gospel, People will respond. What's the gospel? The Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. This is the message that we go out sharing. And, uh, and we can thank God that, that he elects people. We can also thank God for election when we're parenting. It's the deepest cry of a Christian parent's heart that our kids will know the Lord and walk with him all the days of their lives. Yet I know in this room there are a lot of you with prodigal sons, prodigal daughters who aren't now walking with the Lord, and that can be a heavy burden, big burden on the heart of a believer, unsaved loved ones. And we can cry out to God for them. That's where our burden gets transferred to the Lord. We can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. He cares for our kids. And, and at the end of the day, their salvation is much less about my amazing fathering skills, right? It, it isn't about all of that. Do we want to be a good example for our kids? Definitely. Do we want to raise them in the way they should go? Definitely. But at the end of the day, it's really between them and the Lord. We can rest in that. And we can also thank God for election when we're worshiping. We gather together on these weekends we look around this room and we can say, God, look at all these people who are here on a Sunday morning. Look at all these people who are giving to you and worshiping you and serving you. 
God, thank you for electing these folks. We're going to be together? Whoa, Lord, that's amazing, right? And that this is, he picks us, and we can thank God for election when we're witnessing, parenting, and worshiping. And so that's the second truth that we thank God for, election. We thank him not only for election, but also for examples. Look at the end of verse 5 there. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. Paul says, hey, you know what kind of people we are? Me, Timothy, Sylvanus, you've seen our lives. He says, and you became imitators of us. You saw the way that we lived. You saw that we got up early and we spent time with the Lord. You saw that we worked hard with our own hands so that we could give to people in need. You saw how we did these works of faith and this labor of love and how we had a steadfastness of hope and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. That They were actually imitating the Lord Jesus Christ in these things. Why does he say that? For you received the word in much affliction. Paul says, just like I did. Paul paid the price for following Jesus. It cost him everything. It would cost him his very own life. He received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Even though there were trials, even though there was affliction, there was still joy. And that's how it was with Jesus. He received the word in much affliction and with the fullness of joy of the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus? It says in Hebrews chapter 12 of his suffering and his joy. Hebrews chapter 12. We look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We look to him as our great example, as our leader who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, this is Hebrews 12, 2, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He's enduring the cross. I don't have to endure things that I enjoy like chocolate cake, not at all. We endure difficulty. He endured the affliction of the cross. He despised the shame of the cross and yet It was for the joy that was set before him. The joy of bringing preeminent glory to God forever and ever. And it says, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we can imitate Paul. We can imitate Jesus. We can imitate the Thessalonians who just keep receiving the word, keep trusting the Bible even when life hurts. And even when life hurts, there can be a joy that God is with us that God is for us, that one day he's going to put a stop to all of this suffering, to all of this sickness, and to all of this death. There is a joy as we walk with him. So these are the examples. He says, so that then you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Hey, then they themselves, the Thessalonians, were an example for everyone else to follow and to imitate. Macedonia and Achaia, uh, on the map here, Macedonia is in northern Greece, and Achaia is down south there. You can see Thessalonica in the harbor there in the red. And then the next slide is what Thessaloniki looks like today. Uh, last night I checked the weather. It was 57 degrees in Thessaloniki. And uh, so that you, it's really awesome about the Bible. You can actually go to these places that it talks about and see, oh, yeah, those places exist. And it makes sense that if we can uh, check to see the truth of, of things in the Bible that we can measure, like history and facts and all of that, that, that the things of earth But it's also true about the things of heaven, the things that we can't measure, that the Bible tells the truth. There's Thessaloniki. You can go there. Maybe we'll take a trip. One of these adventures with Bill. Let's go to Thessaloniki, right? So that'd be good. So we thank God for examples, uh, the, the examples we've had and the examples we are. Have you had some good examples in your life? 
One of the great examples in my life was a guy by the name of Victor Nature. Great name, Victor, right? So Victor Nature, and there uh, I was on a short-term mission trip for about three months to Aguas Calientes, Mexico. And I went to Aguas Calientes with $40 in my wallet, a pair of swim trunks, and a passport. And I was going to be, and Victor said, uh, you're not going to go hungry. It's going to be beans and rice in Jesus Christ, but we're going to feed you, make sure that you're going to be okay. And when I went down there on this crusade, it was a $250,000 budget to turn the city upside down with the gospel, with medical clinics and dental clinics and sports clinics and art competitions and everything, inviting people to the Plaza de Toros for a festival de vida. So Victor was very busy in charge of this whole thing with 70 different churches involved, but he knew something about me. And that is that I was head over heels in love with this girl, Jenny, that I couldn't wait to propose to and marry. And so every day when he would pass me by in the office, he'd kind of whisper and say, she's coming, man. I'm like, I know, she's coming. She's going to be here soon. And when she gets here, I'm going to, I know that you're like walking from where you're staying to our office. I'm going to give you the keys to my car so you can drive around the city. I'm going to put money in your wallet so you can take her out to nice meals. And I'm going to make sure she's got a great place to stay while she's here. I'm thinking, Victor, you've got a lot of responsibility on your plate. How are you keeping up with my love life, you know? But what was he doing? He found out something that was very important to me. And when he was near me, when he was hanging out with me, he made it important to him. It was a really awesome example of being lovingly concerned about another person. And you know what? He followed through on it. Uh, totally got her a place to stay in the city, gave me the keys to his car, the whole deal. And uh, I really thank the Lord for his example. Hey, we can thank God for examples by remembering them. Think about the people that God has put into your life that make you say, I want to follow Jesus the way that they follow Jesus. We can thank God for examples by imitating them. When I'm hanging out with other people, finding out, hey, what's important to them? And can I make that a little bit more important to me while I'm hanging out with them? And then we can thank God for examples by providing examples for other people to see and for other people to follow. Really, really great. Well, we also thank God for evangelism. Look with me at verse 8. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. We thank God for evangelism that proclaims and spreads God's word. That's what they were doing. He says the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. It's gone up north, it's gone down south, and you're not even using Twitter or TikTok or anything like that. That the word of God is spreading from you there in Thessalonica, and your faith has gone forth everywhere. So we don't even need to tell people about you. Other people are hearing. Hey, Table Rock Fellowship, I thank God for the way that you practice evangelism. I thank God for the way that you're, the word of the Lord is spreading forth all over the place. Uh, through, say, our live stream. I talked to a guy this morning. He said, my brother back in New Jersey was watching last night. We get people from all over the world writing in and saying, hey, we're live streaming. It's like so amazing that the word of the Lord has sounded forth clear back from Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. It sounds forth into Oregon right here today. And then it sounds forth from here and goes all around the world and also here in southern Oregon as we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. A couple of Fridays ago, I watched that missions film to the ends of the earth in our kids' church. It was about these missionary pilots who fly to unreached tribes and support the missionaries who are there. And uh, I was so encouraged by the way that these tribal people were getting saved. And then when they got saved, they wanted to go and share the gospel with the next tribe over. They wanted to reach to the ends of the earth and they would like travel for days to go to another tribe that they might have been kind of at warring with, that there was bad blood between these tribes and yet they wanted to go and share the gospel with them. And I thought, man, that's so awesome to see people sharing God's word, to have a heart for it. And remember what it was like when you first got saved? You just wanted to share the gospel with other people. 
you know, if I saw a good movie, I'd want to tell somebody about it. If I listened to a good album, I'd want to tell somebody about it. If I went to a good restaurant, I'd want to tell somebody about it. Here I'd found a good savior and I got to tell everybody about him. Do you know how easy it is to get rid of this burden of guilt, get rid of this filth of shame? Do you know how easy it is to have peace with God? Do you know how easy it is to have purpose and meaning and significance in your life? It's just by trusting Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. And off I went, sharing the gospel, and I found they weren't as excited to hear about Jesus as I thought that they would be. But there's something there, isn't it? And I'm sure I was zealous and, you know, could have been, like, more skillful and, you know, considerate and all that stuff. But don't forget the excitement of that first love that people are dying to hear about a Savior who is good and glorious. So let's thank God for evangelism by looking for it, watching for people who are doing evangelism, like coming to the movie and seeing it. And let's also thank God by doing it, by actually sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. This is what I'm talking about by actually putting it into practice. We thank God for it when we see it in other people, just praise God for it. But then uh, good works in the Christian life, uh, why do we do good works? Is it because we're earning our way to heaven, that we are hoping that our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds? Not at all. That's not why we do the good works. A great reason or motivation for good works in the Christian life is to say, thank you, Lord. God, there I was as one of those lepers on the outskirts, isolated, separated, deadened. I just cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. God, I didn't bring you anything except a bunch of sin. And God, you rescued me. You saved me. You cleaned me up. I haven't arrived, but you're still at work in my life. And from here to there, I just want to say thank you, Lord. I just want to live a thank you life. That's what we're doing from here to there. Why do we do good works? To say thank you to the Lord. You know, uh, one of the things as a dad and as parents, we totally get this. So, Um, I am so blessed that as, you know, we provide things for our kids, they take good care of them. So I've got a 16-year-old daughter who's driving this car that her mom and I bought for her, and I am so thankful when she thanks me for it by taking good care of it. Wouldn't it be sad if, like, she's just driving it all over the place, running it into the ground, not caring at all? I'm like, this is the way that you say thanks to me? But she actually does a really good job of taking care of this car, and I know that she appreciates the gift Hey, do you appreciate the gift of salvation? Do you appreciate what God has done for you? Let's live a thank you life by practicing these things. Well, we also thank God for salvation, the fifth truth about them and about us. Verse 9, for they, they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. Paul says, when we go places... Uh, word about you guys has gotten there before we do. And when we get there, they tell us about what God's doing in you there in Thessalonica, how you received us, how you welcomed us, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. These are the key verses of the book of Thessalonians. There is richness here. Let's enjoy the gospel. We thank God for salvation because we're reconciled. We turn to God. We have turned away from idols. We were worshiping these idols. You say, I never had little idols, statues of Buddha or anything like that. No, these are idols of the heart that we can worship the idols of power, we worship the idols of money, we worship the idols of sex, we worship the idols of drugs and alcohol, all of these idols. And and an idol can even be a good thing, like our family or our job or whatever, that we turn into an ultimate thing, so that if we lose it, we would have no reason to live. But he says, you turn to God. That's reconciliation, there's peace. From idols, that's redemption. Redemption. And we're enlisted. We serve God who is living and true to serve the living and true God. So good to be serving the Lord, to have meaning and significance in our lives. 
Every day and every way, just serving Jesus. You're sweeping a floor, you're sweeping that floor for Jesus. We're actually enlisted in his service. He is the living God. Those idols, they're dead. He is the true God. Those idols, they are false. They are lying idols. They cannot save. They cannot satisfy. They cannot help. They're blind idols. They're deaf idols. And those who worship them become like them. But we are reconciled. We're redeemed. We're enlisted in his service. And we're hopeful. We await our heavenly bridegroom who conquered death. That's what he says. And await for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Church, you are the bride of Christ. And you and I are waiting for this bridegroom up there in heaven. Do you remember what it was like to await someone on a wedding day? I do. There I was, standing in a vineyard. A band is playing this song before the throne of God above. And I'm looking out at all the family and friends. And they're nice to see, but where's she? She, The bride is about to come down the aisle, escorted by the father of the bride. And I'm not as excited to see him as I am to see her. I'm looking out at all the details that she cared about, the flowers, the ribbon, the colors, but I just want to see her. There was that eager expectation, that longing in my heart, and here she came, the most beautiful sight I've ever seen down that aisle on that day. We are eagerly awaiting a heavenly bridegroom. Jesus is coming back soon. We're waiting for his son, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who is coming back soon from heaven. And we're rescued. We're delivered from the wrath to come. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is a coming wrath. You know, in California, with these big storms and mudslides and everything lately, uh, the the notice could be really short. Hey, you got to get out of here because there's a flood that's going to wipe out this whole town. The tornadoes back in Mississippi, I think it was, evacuate, take cover. There's a warning. Hey, there is a coming wrath that God is going to put a stop to all of the wickedness. He's going to put a stop to all of the sin. He's going to put a stop to all of the evil. And he's going to de- he destroyed the world one time with a flood, and the second time he's going to destroy it with fire. There is a coming wrath that we have been rescued from, delivered from, that Jesus has saved us from the wrath to come. Aren't you so glad? That this wrath that we so richly deserve, he in mercy and grace has saved us from it. And now instead of the wrath that we do deserve, it is the favor and the blessing that we don't deserve. There is a marriage supper of the great God. And we as those lepers have been cleansed by him. And he says, come take a seat at the table, the seat of honor as the bride of Christ, most exalted and elevated position showcasing forever. How merciful and gracious and good God is. He is the one who rescues us from the wrath to come. And so we thank God for all that he has done in our salvation. And you notice that these three sisters show up again here at the end of this passage. Faith, how you turned to God from idols in faith. Love, to serve the living and true God in love and to hope to wait for his son from heaven. We thank God for salvation. You know, I uh, spoke this last Monday. I had a baptism certificate show up in my box, and uh, Lewis gave me permission to share his story. Bobby Bob baptized him uh, last Sunday. And I said, why was it then? And he said, because I knew at long last that I was forgiven of all of my sin, that Jesus had forgiven me. And I said, praise God, what a great reason to be baptized. It's salvation. God actually rescues people. He actually forgives us of our sins. And so we thank God for salvation by growing in it. We keep turning to God from idols. We can be tempted to go back to those old idols, but we don't. We just keep growing in our salvation, continuing to turn to the Lord. 
And he says, to serve a living and true God, we can thank God for salvation by serving him. Are you serving the Lord in some kind of sacrificial way? And if you really want to know a a sacrificial way to serve the Lord, have I got a junior high ministry for you. (laughs) I got some middle school boys up there. The room is loud. No kidding. Praise God for the way that the youth group has doubled in size over the last few months. We had about 30 kids coming. Now we've got about 60 kids coming. And it's an honest appeal. If you'd like to serve God, there are people who are called to middle school ministry, to high school ministry. You're like, not it, Pastor, but some of you guys I know. We've got two folks who have been serving God in youth group here at the fellowship for over 20 years. God calls people to serve in youth ministry. And and if you'd like to serve in youth ministry or something else, to serve the living and true God, hey, let us know. We'd love to get you doing something that you're good at in an area that you care deeply about. The mission is great. Well, this week, let's be like the one leper who thanked God, not like the nine who didn't. This week, let's be like the Apostle Paul who looked for good things in the lives of others and thanked God for them. This week, let's be like the Thessalonians who provided a good example so that it's worth talking about thousands of years later. Let's be like Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. Let's thank God this week for essentials, election, examples, evangelism, and salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks. For our Savior, Father, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for rescuing folks who were just like those lepers. Jesus, you are so merciful. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for saving us. And we remember your salvation even now as we partake of communion together. In Jesus' name, amen. The communion tables are open. Please help yourselves and hold on to them. We'll partake together momentarily. Thanksgiving shows up in communion. He blesses the bread, and he gives thanks for the cup. The word gives gives thanks for the cup. It's the Eucharist. That's uh, Eucharisto. uh, Gives thanks for the cup. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, we thank you so much for the body and blood of Jesus. It was sacrificed for us. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Your benediction today is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, uh, yep, that uh, the Lord bless you that we uh, sang earlier. Really good stuff. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 28. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and all God's people said, Amen. amen. God bless you guys.